Thank you, everybody. Uh, before I get started, I want to um, take a moment to just uh, thank Andy Wilson. This was his idea, uh, this topic. And so um, I think Andy and probably everybody else who's known me for a while probably had the same thought. Like, <laughs> what, the, what the hell? How did that happen? Um, and I'll go a little bit into detail on, uh, on my experience. And it is great to see this community grow so much. Two or three years ago, when did Invade Pasadena start? Three years ago, I remember uh, we were an early sponsor at Guided Software. We sponsored an event at Twin Palms. Um, we wanted to support the tech community in Pasadena, number one. And number two, Andy was very persistent in uh, asking <laughs> us for a sponsorship. Uh, so we did it. But gosh, you know, I didn't think it was going to work. <laughs> it's, it's really been amazing to see to see the growth. Um, so it's very gratifying to, uh, to be in front of, uh, of this group today. I don't have too much in the way of slides, but uh, I will dive into this. So I'm gonna go a little bit into, into detail on my own personal story. Um, and then to the extent possible, uh, there may be some lessons that are applicable to people in general. Um, and uh, lastly, what should, what should you do yourself? So um, I was uh, and am a lawyer. Uh, I, I, I worked for a bank as an analyst for a few years, went to law school, and uh, then worked for a big law firm, and then worked for a series of uh, tech companies as general counsel, two up in the Bay Area, and, uh, and then guided software here in Pasadena. I joined as general counsel in 2003. It's now a public company, um, but at the time, I think in 2002, it had done nine million in revenue. Um, I joined in the spring of 03, so it was pretty small, uh, 70, 80 people. And I was the first corporate lawyer uh, hired at the company. And I was recruited into that position with the promise that I have an opportunity on the business side. The company at that time made software, still makes forensic software, made software that was used in court cases, used by law enforcement. So there was this use case of the software in the legal realm. And uh, when, I, when I got the job, they pitched the idea that I'd be able to work on the business side. So I joined in the spring of 03. Uh, the following year started running the professional services group. We had come out with an enterprise version of that software. So rather than law enforcement using it, it would go out across a network and you can do internal investigations, fraud investigations, that sort of thing on laptops, desktops, servers across an environment. And the professional services group that I was leading at that point would implement the software, number one, when somebody bought it, but also would, if they didn't have internal forensic experts and they didn't have the software, we would do engagements. We would do jobs where we would use our software. Uh, and they pass, and that was good, but we also wanted to display, to show off the capabilities of the software. So mid-2004, I'm running professional services, and we complete a job for McAfee. They didn't have the software. They were selling a business unit to a private equity firm, Silver Lake. And as part of the deal, Silver Lake wanted to make sure that, they, that, that McAfee wasn't keeping the intellectual property. So they needed to certify that they didn't have any of the source code. Mm. I don't know what their internal uh, capabilities were at the time, but back in 2004, they didn't have a good sense for who had the source code and who didn't among their 5,000 developers on five different continents. <laughs> and they wanted to get the deal closed. It was like a $300 million deal. So they hired us, and we didn't have a, a way to do it either because um, in an internal investigation, you're investigating a couple of computers. Maybe there's a little bit of fraud, you're looking at three computers or five or seven. And this was 5,000. Um, and if you go one by one, it's a little bit like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. By the time you get done, you know that source code has been transferred around and it's back on the first one. Um, but some consultants in our, in our professional services group built some automation to put in an IP range, uh, put in the search criteria looking for the source code, and just have the software in an automated fashion do it. We got the job done, searched the 5,000 computers in a few weeks, they closed the deal, McAfee paid us, everybody was happy. 
So I was sitting there at the time thinking, wait a second, other people could use this. When they get sued um, and they have information, it doesn't, it didn't have to be for source code. You can look for anything. You could look for Excel spreadsheets with the word subprime in it. And it struck me, <laughs> just as an example. Uh, I don't know where, where I came up with that example. That was crazy. Uh, and it struck me that other people could use it at the time. So um, many of you probably aren't familiar with the legal realm, but the, the rules that govern court cases in the United States, you turn information over to the other side. The idea is, I don't think it really works, but the idea is if everybody had information on the actual facts, they would settle the cases and not burden the court system. What happens is they fight over turning information and not turning over information. But those rules were written in the 70s and the 80s, and they were written for paper documents at the time. They were written for paper documents. So it wasn't, even though everybody was using email and computers and everything, the rules did not specify anything about electronic evidence. However, it didn't take a genius to figure out that they would have to change the rules sooner or later. I used to say all of the evidence is digital. Email, text, everything was digital. And the idea that the rules didn't apply, um, that, that was factually true. Um, but sooner or later, they would have to change those rules, I thought. Um, so, so I had this idea that other people could use it. Um, it wasn't productized. Uh, the rules didn't apply. And um, so I had this idea that I should go and start pitching it to potential customers. And I could have gone to the product steering committee and asked for approval to productize this. But I think what would have happened, and I thought then what would happen, is that it would be shot down. There was no market for it. There was no market for it. The joke inside the company is we were selling a product that didn't exist to solve a problem that they didn't know they had. <laughs> there was a lot of truth to that. Um, but I was traveling anyway for running professional services. We had offices in New York and D.C., and so I would travel. And so I had this idea that I'll just go and kind of Shanghai a salesperson to take me out to see a customer. We'll pitch this idea. And uh, it was a little bit of a skunk works project. Um, it, it, is, it is true that I believed that the CEO at the time wouldn't get too mad at me if he found out. <laughs> But it's also true that he didn't know about it. Um, and, 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 and nobody, uh, there were just a few of us. And, I, and believe me, I had, to, I had to calm people down and tell them that don't worry, if anything goes sideways, I'll take the blame. Uh, because I thought it was a good idea. So we went out and pitched this. And, and I, still have, I still have the original decks when we went out to J.P. Morgan Chase and Cigna. And we pitched this idea. And a funny thing happened. They said no. <laughs> you know, the product doesn't exist. Uh, we talked about how we would we had the technology, we productized it. And it was a problem they didn't really know they had. So we went on a bunch of these and they kept saying no. So um, we just kept doing it. <laughs> you know, and then eventually we found that we found somebody to say yes. How many how many said no before one said yes? Uh, so the question is how many said no before one said yes? I'm not sure, but it was a lot. I mean, you know, a dozen, maybe? I mean, it, it took a while. Now, they didn't say it was a crazy idea. They acknowledged that, you know, yeah, they were going to have to deal with electronic evidence at some point. But acknowledging that and pulling out your checkbook are two totally different things. So we got a lot of head nodding, and the salesperson would say, that was a good meeting. <laughs> and then nothing. So... Uh, we got a little lucky, we got a launch customer um, that had uh, a company that had a lot of litigation, they had 800 active lawsuits. Um, so the nice thing about having 800 active lawsuits, there are a lot of bad things about it, but when you're a vendor selling to them, the nice thing about it is some of them, maybe 20 of them, involved electronic evidence. Remember, the rules hadn't changed at this point. But it was a business problem for them. So they ended up, we, we were able to get a customer. Uh, so at the time, we were, the largest deal we'd ever done in the company's history was about eight or 900,000. And we got this customer for 2.4 million. 
So that was very cool. We were a startup, you know, we were small. Then we got a couple more customers, productized it. Uh, there was a lot of work that went involved in that and, and learning how to implement it and, and test it. Um, and then we got lucky. Then, then the, the federal courts changed the rules. And they said, hey, uh, the discovery rules apply to electronic evidence, not just paper. And we had a product already and reference customers. So it turned out to be really, really, really good for the company. Uh, and we grew uh, quite a bit on the backs of that uh, to the point where by the end of 06, we went public. Um, and in fact, Morgan Stanley was uh, our bankers. They, I think, um, I think they know what they're doing when it comes to marketing uh, IPOs. They had us on the road the week the new rules were going into effect. So it turned out uh, to be really good from a career perspective for me. And that wasn't why I did it. Um, I just thought it was a good idea. And uh, so I just went and did it. I just, you know, I could have, I think it's true that I could have uh, left and started a company. You know, I had this idea. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that today um, because everybody has this idea that you either start a company or you're kind of a drone inside a company, you know, slaking away in a cube. Maybe I'm overstating you. Um, but, but, and starting a company is a great thing. If you can do that, I encourage you to do that. Um, and I hope everybody here starts a company because it'll really help this tech community take off. I personally didn't feel like I was in a position to do that at that time. I was, um, I had a, I think a three-year-old and a two-year-old, and we had just bought our first house in Pasadena, so anybody who has purchased a house knows how affordable it is. <laughs> um, so I had this mortgage, uh, two little kids, and. Um, I just didn't feel like I was in a good position to do that. So I just decided to do it inside the company. And, and that's one of the things I want to kind of get across is if you have an idea, just go do it. Pursue it. And if you're running a company and somebody has an idea, let them go. Don't, I mean, look, uh, you need some processes. I get that. But if somebody has, has something that's, that, that is going to be innovative and, and you find out about it, you know, don't come down too hard on them. I felt comfortable with the person running the company that if this thing didn't work and we decided that it, it wasn't something worth pursuing and he found out about it, that he wouldn't be too mad at me because we had an environment at that time where we tried lots of things. And I think that's important inside a, a, a growing company. I have an arrow up there for endpoint security. So it turned out to be good from a career perspective. I ended up becoming president, uh, doing the IPO, and then becoming CEO the following year. And we grew pretty well in the backs of that e-discovery product. But the number of companies that have lots of litigation and that could really um, benefit from it, uh, as, you, as we sold through the Fortune 100 or Fortune 500, the business problem we were solving was getting smaller, right? So if you have 800 lawsuits, big business problem. If you have eight, moderate business problem. If you have one, small business problem. So uh, we had this idea, I had, I had an idea that um, we had software on all these endpoints, desktops, laptops, servers, and like everyone kind of knew that antivirus software was becoming less and less effective every year. I mean, everybody knew it, but and I didn't know at the time, this is, a, this is like 2011, 2012, um, that there were a bunch of startups, a couple in Orange County, that were founded at the same time to go after the same market. But we hired some developers and kind of let them develop something that would, that would solve this problem. Um, and so we were early in that market as well. I distinctly recall, I distinctly recall a board meeting with a very seasoned, experienced uh, board member who asked me how big the market was for next generation endpoint security. You know, and I told him the truth, which maybe wasn't the right answer, um, because I said it doesn't exist. It 
doesn't exist, but it will. <laughs> so he thought I was crazy. Um, so in both cases here, uh, in the e-discovery market, we launched, I uh, got that first customer in 2005. Gartner eventually came out with a magic quadrant for e-discovery software. And they came out with their first iteration of that in 2011. So six years later. Uh, so we were, there was no market when we launched it. And then uh, in the fall of 2014, Gartner did their first um, first research, they haven't done a magic quadrant, but their first research on endpoint detection and response, and which is their name for this next generation endpoint security, and they named us the market share leader in that. So we were constantly searching for bigger markets. That was the one thing in the back of my mind was that forensic software was a relatively small market. How can we use this technology and get to something bigger? Um, and when I was running the company, I tried to let people, you know, pursue this. I'm not a software developer, so I had an idea for a market, but the product had to be put together by software developers. So we hired a couple people and kind of let them run with it. Without any real clear, I mean, we had some goals, but we didn't really know where it would end up. Um, so that's my message overall, is that if you're inside a company, um, and you want to start a company, great, go do it, um, if you can. But if you feel like you can't, don't take that as a, therefore I can't do anything innovative. Um, if you're at an organization that's overly bureaucratic and really squashes that, I don't know, maybe go somewhere else, because that's not fun. It's fun to do, it's fun to do stuff that's, it's fun to innovate. It's fun to try to solve problems. I always felt like, I mean, this is going to sound kind of corny, but I always felt like we were solving a problem for somebody. Um, that we were, in a really tiny way, making the world a little better place. They had a business problem and we were able to, to help them with it. So, so that's my story. Um, and... You can tell that I don't have much in the way of slides because I've basically covered most of this. Um, the idea is that you can pursue innovation even inside a company if you don't feel that you're in a position to start a company. And sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're not for various reasons, responsibilities you might have um, that just don't enable it. Um, and if you're running a company, I know a bunch of people here are entrepreneurs and are running companies. You know, uh, you started the company, you had an idea, you ran with it. There are people inside your company, when they come up with those ideas, if you don't let them run with it, then they'll go somewhere else. So if you want to benefit from their innovation, you want to create an environment that enables them to take advantage of that. So I have a slide here and this is a little bit tongue in cheek because I don't know, I don't know what you should do. <laughs> you know, this is my story and, 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 and very specific to the environment that I was in. Um, my overall approach is if you can start a company and you have the wherewithal to do that, and you have a good idea, go for it. That's really what drives the, drives the ecosystem and drives the tech uh, economy. Um, if you have an idea, just pursue it. It doesn't have to be starting a company. You could have an idea, like people did three years ago, for a tech community in Pasadena that they started up from nothing, nothing. They had the idea, it took them, I, what was the original name? Was it originally Innovate Pasadena? I think, I think it might have even been a different name, but they had the idea and they just went and did it. So that's the... Um, that's my takeaway. You have an idea, pursue it. By the way, just to be clear, I don't mean any kind of willy-nilly crazy idea that pops into your brain. <laughs> you have to think about it, right? I mean, we spent some time between closing that McAfee deal and going on the first sales call. There were a number of months in there where we talked about it, we bounced it off, we crafted how we would position it, and we thought about it, and always consider the possibility. You might be wrong, so, you know, you might have to adjust. We, we thought about it for a while um, before we before we went ahead, um, and, it, and it really worked out well. Um, so before I take questions, just very quickly uh, for myself, 
Um, I tried being an early retiree. It's not a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> if you're a type A personality, it just does not work. I, it does not work. I, I went and I drop my kid off for his ride to school. I go work out. It'd be eight o'clock. Like, this is awful. <laughs> so, um, so I joined a board of a software company, um, which is different being on the other side of the table um, and an interesting perspective. And I also have I have an I have an idea. I've had this idea for a long time. Uh, having been the general counsel of three different tech companies when I came in, uh, I, I noticed uh, that there were a bunch of things that they hadn't really lined up properly. Um, and so there were mistakes that, made, that were made and that had to be fixed. Um, but by the same token, uh, most startups, um, even when you get a little bit of revenue, you don't need a general counsel. You don't need a CFO, you need developers, you need product marketing people. But you don't need those people, but you don't need zero either. So I had this idea that um, you know, one general counsel or one CFO is too much, zero is not enough. Um, so I think you need like an eighth of a general counsel. <laughs> so I have this, and I just hooked up with a law firm down, downtown uh, to kind of offer this to tech companies. I've done it a bunch of times. I'm on the other side now on, 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 a, on a board. And uh, that's literally just this week. I've had the idea for a while, talked about it to people, bounced it off people. That's where the idea for this presentation came, by the way. I was having drinks with Andy. Um, and pitched this idea to him, and, and after a few drinks, he came up with this topic. So, as he does, yeah. And uh, so that's what I'm up to uh, to nowadays. Um, phone, email, also I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so please look me up there, and I'd be happy to take questions. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing your inspiring story. It's really cool to hear about people that are coming up with companies within a company. It's a very rare treat. So thank you so much for sharing that story and congratulations to your success. You. We're gonna open up to Q&A. Lots of questions over here. Their arms are up. Um, wait a second, John's not here, right? You had a bail? He's in some other meetup, unfortunately. So I guess I'll be walking around with the mic. If you have a question, raise your hand, we'll get it answered. Comments, we're gonna save it offline. Will you stick around for a little bit? Afterwards? Sure, yeah, okay. and I'll just talk really loudly so you can... You no, can... There's, a, there's another mic here. Wired, yeah. Okay, yeah, cool. Okay, cool. So I'll walk around. Here we go. Putting your CEO hat back on. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I know. My voice was coming from all over. Um, putting your CEO hat back on. Um, how would you feel if a an employee, you know, you know, handed in their resignation and three weeks later you saw they had a startup with a product you wish they had come to you with? Yeah, I would feel very good about that. <laughs> you know, it, look, it, it kind of depends, right? If you're at a company making forensic software and, and, and cybersecurity software, and the idea for a startup is electric car chargers, you know, it's pretty far afield to, <laughs> for what you're doing. I'm, I'm, it, it could be the most brilliant idea uh, of all time, but it's not in your wheel. It's not in your wheelhouse as a company. So I, I guess the answer is it depends. Um, but if it were in, uh, this this one very much was in our wheelhouse of something we could do, I would feel like I, you know, why didn't they feel like they could bring it up here? So I think if you want, if you want that stuff to be, remain inside, you have to give people some freedom. Victor, thanks for the comments. Thinking about I think Google or Facebook gives 20% of the, their employees time to pursue projects and so forth. Um, running professional services, you had some bogeys for your, for the day job of the company while you were innovating. What are your comments about how to balance out that, that passion to go after something that might lead you to want to do it all the time, but then keeping it within the bounds of you, you've got to make a living for the company while you're innovating as well. How do you, as a CEO, how do you suggest letting people run but keeping their eye on the day job of it to make payroll? Uh, yeah, so you're right. Um, when I was running professional service, I had taken it over and I did have targets in terms of uh, revenue and, and p and responsibility. So, you know, that was job number one. 
Um, and I had to kind of do this a little bit on the side, right? Um, and there were still people involved. There were other people involved that were doing it on the side just because we thought it would be cool. Um, I know that Google for a long time had that policy where you could spend, a, I think they've gotten rid of it. Um, does anybody know? I think they got rid of that. Yeah, I thought it was like uh, they can work on a creative project, they had to present what they found, so it was still productive in ways, and also slightly structured. But I don't know if it still exists. Yeah, you know, at one point they talked about all the great innovation they got out of that, and it was like Gmail, Google Maps, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, they're good. I use those services, but it wasn't like they came up with the idea of mapping software or they came up with the idea with, of email. You know, it just seemed like it was very derivative. Um, so we didn't have that type of formal policy. Um, and it's, it's a balance, right? You can't, you can't have, the idea of a company is everybody is sort of, um, it's an organization where everybody's, if things are going well, aiming towards a common goal, right? So you just can't have 500 people all doing 500 separate things. Um, but I guess what I'm suggesting is if somebody does something that's a little bit pushes the boundaries, Lockheed used to have the term of skunk works, right? If they do something that's a little skunk works-ish, let them go. Let them do it. Excellent. Next question. Hi. Thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, two quick questions. One, would you agree one of the lessons is better to ask forgiveness than permission? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. A absolutely. Um, you know, um, if I had asked permission, we would not have done it. Okay. There was no market for it. Okay. And second, uh, what's been the biggest struggle with gaining more market share? Uh, you, you mentioned trying to you know, get a bigger market for the product you have now. What's been the biggest struggle? Well, so... Um, when I joined the company, we made, uh, the company had really pioneered computer forensic software, and it was a very, very small market. It wasn't a matter of market share, it was the size of the, the TAM was not big. Um, and even today, it's not big. So, the idea was to try to get to larger TAMs, really, fundamentally. The, the push into cybersecurity, uh, the endpoint security, so part of that was like, okay, wait a second. Wait a second. Uh, how many people can use endpoint security software? All of them, right? Worldwide. How many people need e-discovery software? Only the people who have a bunch of lawsuits, right? So if you were doing a Venn diagram, it was a much smaller bubble. So we were just trying to find larger TAMs. It wasn't so much. We did very well. We were in the leaders quadrant in the Gardner uh, Magic Quadrant for e-discovery software all four years that they published it while I was there. Um, we did well in the markets we were in, which is how do we get to a bigger TAM? I might have an idea for market share. Okay, great. Thanks, ben, thanks, Victor, for your presentation. I really appreciate it. You touched on something really quickly and really obliquely. Can you talk a little bit more about convincing the prospect or target that they've got a problem they don't know they have? Yeah, that's that's a hard thing, right? So um, you spend a lot of your time evangelizing in that early market. We spent a lot of time um, we spent a lot of time thinking about how to position the company and how to position the problem. So the first probably not half, but the first third of the presentation was defining the problem and trying to get those heads to nod and asking them the questions that you probably knew the answer to, but you framed it as a question rather than a, than a statement so that they were, saying, they were identifying their problems. Um, that was something, uh, you know, we had done that. So we started out making computer forensic software for law enforcement, launched the first enterprise version of that where you had to go, you could go across a network and so we had some experience in pioneering markets, um, but it wasn't easy. That's not easy. I mean, the head nodding in a meeting is, it's, it's, it's like step one of 10, you know, before you get the money. 
uh, before they're before they're buying from you. So it wasn't easy, but we spent a fair amount of that time. That period of time when we were testing it out and thinking about it was how are we going to position this this business problem? Once the rules changed, it became very easy. Then then it was just a question of when they would buy, and they don't have to buy your product, they could buy another one, but it became a question of when they would do it. But before that, it was very very much a question of why. Next question over here. The slide I wanted to see was the one that said, you know, here's five do's and here's five don'ts. If you want to have a company that will allow the kind of innovation within it that uh, allowed you to prosper. Uh, my question would be, of those don'ts, which one do you really want to avoid uh, that's still very, very tempting? <laughs> so that's, that's, a good, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know that I have five. Um, we had a bunch of other things that happened inside the company that we tried and we just kind of, you need to have a mindset of let's try this and see what happens, right? So I'll give you an example. This is gonna sound really minor, but we tried it. So we had, as part of our, as part of our business, we had a training group that would train people on how to become computer forensic examiners. And people would pay to come take classes and we started doing it online, we did live classroom stuff. And when we looked at the data, we found out that the average person took about two classes. Um, I'll just make the math very easy. Uh, let's say it was 2,000 bucks a class. So they take two classes and over the life of that customer, on average, we get 4,000 bucks. So we tried, we got this idea from Disneyland. Um, they had the annual pass for Southern California residents. When you have little kids, you can wear all this stuff. Yes. And so, um, so we came, we launched this idea for a passport where they'd pay 5,000 bucks and they would have an unlimited number of classes for one year. It, it wasn't gonna be that big of a deal on the company one way or another, but you would be surprised at how many people didn't wanna do that. Because what happens if they take 13 classes? This is, you know. Well, the point, the point of the matter is there might be a couple people who do that, but the more classes they take, the better they are in our software, the more likely they are to buy more. I mean, there were all these benefits. And if it didn't work, you cancel it, right? So you try it for a year and see what happens. And oh, everybody takes 13 classes and it's costing us too much and our margins are way below what they should be. Okay, don't do it anymore. I mean, you have to have that kind of mindset of just because you try something doesn't mean you're going to do it for the next 25 years. Uh, in point of fact, they only took on average about three, and it worked out 2.8 or something. It worked out really well for us. They did take a we wanted them to take more training, and we got a lot, a little bit more money from them, and uh, it cemented them into our product set better. Um, and it turned out to be a good thing. I think the company, this is a number of years later, the company still does it. But that's an idea, like it's not the biggest thing in the world, right? There's a lot of stuff like that. There's inertia inside companies. Uh, there's inertia, it's weird. Uh, and a company that starts out very innovative over time, processes get put in place. Mm -hmm. I'm using that term processes very, processes are the term you use if you like it. <laughs> if you don't like it, you call it bureaucracy. <laughs> so processes get put into place to try to, I don't know, I, I think companies lose, I think companies lose that ability to say, let's just try it. You know, it's the innovator's dilemma if you've ever read Clayton Christensen's book, right? Okay, you build a business here doing this. Well, now that's your business. So how are you going to try something different if it if it potentially could harm that business? The people running training were like, "This is where our costs are going to go." You know, they had margin targets, and and uh, you know they had a PL that they had to run, and we were trying something. Um, and there are lots of examples like that. You have to be willing to try stuff, right? Andy and crew didn't know whether Innovate Pasadena would take off. You have to be willing to try stuff, and everybody here who's an entrepreneur and started a company has that mindset. 
And if you grow your company and you do better and it gets bigger, don't lose it. So I don't know if that's one thing or five things, but that's my that's my number one. We have time for one more question. So you have an idea. You decide you're going to test it out internally. You establish some validity, some validation. You go to your CEO and you say, this is the plan. Yeah, I didn't do that last part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, at some point, though, you do. At some point when you have enough, you, you have to basically bring it, yeah? At the time when you bring it, there must be some implied suggestion, at least, or some expectation on your part that this is going to be better for you. Yeah? You're going to basically benefit in some material way from the growth and the enterprise value that you deliver. Now you have a dispute because the company says, thank you very much, Victor. Everything you've developed belongs to us. And you can't go and develop it on your own. Uh, and uh, we absolutely dispute that you should get anything more than you're getting right now. So thanks very much. What do you do then? So that is a different life story. <laughs> the presentation by itself, huh? Um, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, rightly or wrongly, I didn't have in, this, in my mind that I'm doing this because it's going to be this great payoff for me personally. In fact, I thought the risks were more on the downside. We're unable to productize it. It becomes a... Uh, I don't know what term I want to use. It becomes a problem in development, and people are going, why the hell did you do that? I thought it was more likely on the downside. As it turned out, um, we were a young company at the time, and so it worked out. But I understand your point. It, there could be a scenario where it doesn't work out. Um, I don't know. I mean, it depends. So part of that is my assessment, having worked with some of the people who were leading the company, I trusted them. Yeah. Right? If I didn't trust them. You have to do that. Right? Because they could have turned around, developed it themselves, and that's it. You remain counsel and you fume and fright for the rest of your career. You're right. So I trusted them. Um, and if I didn't, you know, it probably would have been different. So it, it's a fair point. If you don't trust the person you work for, that's a that it's going to be a much different, uh, much different environment. All right, guys, thank you so much for your questions. Thank you, everyone.